G'day everyone, it's James Davis from the Pax8 Academy down here in APAC again, and I've got uh, Brendan Ritchie from Lightwire. Uh, thanks James. for joining me. You're very welcome. It's first time so. being a guest on a podcast rather than hosting it, so I'm, I'm excited, mate. It's a very different, uh, it's a very different vibe, but it should be fun. I, I think I still prefer being a guest, so <laughs> we'll see how you go. Maybe you'll get the itch. Right. We'll compare notes after. <laughs> well. I really wanted to get you on here because, um, you know, we've obviously we've had a lot of conversations backwards and forwards and what really sparked my curiosity is the fact that you're um, expanding your business from based in New Zealand and expanding and um, trying to grow it across the ditch here in Australia. And uh, I can see a lot of um, technology businesses uh, are either needing to think about it or just at that point of thinking there could be an opportunity so i thought this would be a great time to have you on and um explore what's what's been the challenges what's went right what's went wrong and, and just get your sort of wisdom to help people fast track it so yeah wisdom's a, a, a scary term but yeah we'll give it a crack <laughs> i'm happy to happy to share my mistakes and and um and the, the things we've done well um probably a smaller amount of those but yeah should be good well let's start with like what what made you want to expand out of, out of new zealand that's a big step to actually um think about okay. it, isn't it yeah it's it's a big call so i think um i'll have to give you i'll keep it brief no one wants to hear a big backstory uh in these podcast intros so i'll try and keep it brief but to understand where, where i've come from uh i had a, a role with another isp uh that shall rename uh, remain nameless uh, just in case they don't want to <laughs> associate themselves with me anymore not sure but my parents were involved in that isp and um they actually for for lifestyle reasons actually wanted to, to move from new zealand to australia and because of that they thought let's recreate what we've done as an isp in new zealand in australia um that was my first experience going okay i'm i'm an australian resident working for a uh, essentially a New Zealand ISP and um, that was up until the end of 2016 and it was probably only about a, a three-year um, period there where, where that was the case um, uh, that might be wrong, be wrong I might be getting my chronology wrong but the key point there is that particular ISP completely changed their business model on the Australian side uh, they moved away from being a a company that worked with the channel to a company that actually tried to be the channel. They tried to be an ISP slash MSP and, and it never really worked. So anyway, I left that company in at the end of 2016 and really didn't have too much of a plan. So I reached out to a man who had been a client of mine uh, in my role at that company, a guy called Andrew Johnson, who is my boss now at Lightwire. And uh, I said, look, um, I've sold you some fiber um, from Melbourne to Hamilton. Uh, we've met a few times for a coffee on my many trips to New Zealand. Um, looking for a gig. I look at your website. Uh, at that point, it was a rural uh, focused website with pictures of cows and farmers because they sold rural wireless. But I knew they had business customers, but you wouldn't know it by by their online presence. And I said, look, I think we should um, expand to Australia. You should build a voice network. You should uh, bring me on. I don't want to leave Australia. Um, and uh, I think we can help a whole set aside business brand and, and build that out. And Andrew being Andrew, he quickly uh, said yes and flew me over a couple of days later to meet the team and the rest is history. So it's been almost seven years now. And um, yeah, there's been a hell of a lot of learnings um, that, that I guess, yeah, we'll go through. But but in terms of what made Lightwire take that opportunity, um, Andrew and I think just saw that it's a massive market. We're excited by the scale. Um, we, we felt that probably what you um, hinted at at the outset there is that when MSPs and telcos get to a certain size, they actually have customer demand often drive that requirement. And then you have a choice of going either we farm that off in joint partnerships or we do it ourselves. And um, yeah, we, Andrew saw the, the, the sense in doing it ourselves and, and uh, we took a punt and yeah, yeah, it's been a big, <laughs> big six or seven years full of learning. Um, and, and look, I, I, you know, the, the point of this podcast today um, is ostensibly to to talk about how to do the Trans Tasman thing well. Um, I would have felt, you know, just being vulnerable and honest here, I would have felt somewhat of a fraud coming on and talking about that maybe a year or so ago um, when I felt like we'd we'd fired a lot of bullets and not a lot of them had necessarily landed. And it's only been in the last. Um, yeah, six to 12 months where most days we have an inbound lead that sales qualified from the type of client we want. And I feel that I can now start to speak with some authority on at least what is working and certainly with some authority on what definitely hasn't worked. Uh, so 
Um, so yeah, just just let me know what you want me to kick off with. Well, let's start with the challenges. Well, what are what are some of the biggest challenges you've had to overcome in that time to start to get it to work and uh, brand. Definitely. So Australians, in my experience, there's the, there used to be, and it is changing a little bit, but there was always that no one ever got fired for buying from Telstra. You know, if Telstra screw up, it's not your fault you chose Telstra. Everyone's going to choose Telstra. So so that was always just a safety piece that we found it really hard to get past. And almost, uh, well, why would I buy from you when I can buy from Telstra? And that was if you're going direct. That's a problem. The next one is if you're in the channel, everyone knows everybody. I mean, you only have to meet, you know, I don't know, Ryan Blaine, Wayne Small, Nigel Moore, like uh, all these people, you, you know, everybody, everybody knows everybody, right? Like the first time you and I caught up, you introduced me to like a bunch of people. And next thing you know, my, my whole network's bigger. So, so you have to, you're an outsider who doesn't know anyone. And that's, that's ultimately the biggest challenge. So you've got to prioritize building a network and ingraining yourself in the fabric of that market. And I definitely didn't do that very well. So that was, that was huge, you know, issue on my part. Um, the other one is, is geographic or perceived geographic focus. Things like domain names, .co.nz, anything looks terrible in the Australian market. .com, .co, okay, .com probably not .org, but, but you know, anything that's .com.au looks terrible in reverse. So you have to get away from any perceived geographical bias. And that also means ideally having an office. We, we didn't have an office for the first four, maybe four and a half, five years of, of being in Australia. And it made a big difference when we got one. You know, you can only do so many job interviews and meetings in cafes, right? And Having a, having a base that's nicely designed, even if it's barely used, gives you legitimacy and, and a sense of permanency in the market. Uh, what else is, has been things we've had to overcome? Regulatory environment, understanding it, particularly as an ISP. You know, the intercept laws are very different country to country. Um, the, uh, the obligations around even network builds, you know, you have to notify, particularly in New Zealand, um, around network builds in a certain way that isn't the same in Australia, but Australia has intercept laws that are quite... Um, quite hard to get your head around as a New Zealander when you're first coming over here. So there's definitely that. Um, yeah, I, I would say the, the language as well, like the, the the language was hard because the Australian ISP space used weird terms like uh, Metro Ethernet, E-Line. Like I know they're, they're terms that are used sort of globally, but in New Zealand, you've got, uh, just as a compare and contrast, right? We've got UFB, BS2, BS3, HSNS, uh, hyperfiber now over here you've got you know MBN TC4 MBN EE you've got Telstra EA you've got all these things that that neither exists on both sides of the Tasman so you really have to take the time to understand it and ideally employ smart people locally who can educate you and the rest of the team on it and I guess there's just the financial overhead um, if you're funding it from New Zealand you're going to cop the exchange rate uh, you are going to find that you are shifting a lot of money over as you take time to build up and so Another barrier really is the cultural or the willingness barrier from a business perspective to to value the endeavor, the effort enough to offset that cost. And I know I'm doing a lot of talking, sorry, but uh, one one thing I did want to say is, in terms of that that particular barrier, that the the the, the break even barrier, it's so hard to know when you've hit that because it's not as simple as ah. Uh, p &L, right? We're bringing in this much money in Australia and it's costing us this much. There's deals we've won in New Zealand where if we didn't have an Australian presence, we simply wouldn't have won them. And they're worth, you know, a million plus a year to us. And and when it was us versus other competitor, you know, our client has told me years later, hey, that was the defining factor. You know, everything was even. We liked all the people we're dealing with, but you're in Australia. And that was it. So that's all built in NZD, right? We don't see that on the Australian ledger. But but without it, the entire group would earn a lot less. So um just it's not necessarily a barrier i suppose but it's a it's a a mindset that says we're going to look past just the straight numbers for a period of time and allow ourselves to to have some wiggle room around how we justify the endeavor and and, and whether or not it's worthwhile that sort of that sort of mindset thing is very interesting um and it would go against most small businesses wouldn't it that natural mm. you've got got control of your you know Let's just say it's that typical forty to seventy person small business is usually when people are starting to look to go to go across the itch. Mm. Um, we're still not that mature in the way that we probably even run our finances on our own entity in our own country, let alone then that mental shift to 
um, think about it differently uh, in a yeah. different country. Um, it, and uh, the exchange rate would be interesting because that that would impact you. you. You're basically paying more money to come across here than the other way around. It's probably easier to come from Australia to go to New Zealand than um, Absolutely, it is. the other way. Definitely. Just on that sort of maturity piece, so um, Andrew uh, heads up a group called London Green Group and there's a couple of other companies in that group. And so even though at the time that I joined Lightwire, we only had about 20 people, uh, it it was run in a very efficient and mature way. Um, and Andrew has always been very good with his financial management. So, um, you know, we were lucky in that while Lightwire looked like a small company, really it was run as a in a slightly bigger more mature way and now we've got 65 staff with with Lightwire, and um you know the same thing remains true today but we did have a slight advantage there because you're right you know for a 20 person company typically it would be quite a big endeavor to to take on all that additional overhead and going back to what you said earlier on about like building the network and you know, having investing a lot more in um local knowledge like if you mm. were to do this again how would you how would you go about it uh, I would start the podcast from day one <laughs> because <laughs> honestly, it's been it's been ridiculous. So it sort of gets into a slightly different. I think this would be true of of uh, any podcast. I think if it's done well, where an unintended consequence is the people who you have on as guests who are just good people who uh, you know are just happy to share their knowledge and introduce you to other good people. And you know, people didn't really know who we were to any great degree until we started the podcast and then you know i'd finish a conversation like with you and you said hey i think there's some people you should talk to and then they say hey there's some people we should talk to and then when we have you on we have uh, nigel moore we the uh, latest episode has him on you know when you've got hundreds thousands of msps as clients and that's our target market and they see us essentially talking to influencers really which is what it is right it's influencer marketing and and they suddenly go oh okay well they can't be complete bullshit because they're right next to those people we trust and know and and, and so it legitimizes the brand far faster than individual meetings or adwords campaigns or you know stall at a at a conference or whatever it, it's actually seeing oh i think i kind of know that person because i've seen them talk about stuff enough times they're talking to people i trust that person who i trust is promoting the the episode they're in with them it just it it really creates that network so that would be the the one thing i would have done way faster um yeah. and uh, yeah i i actually had someone um uh a guy mark um the ceo of uh, Chalo, an organization in new zealand which which uh, telco which hasn't come over here and he was saying to me the other day when i met with him that um the australian telco landscape is littered with the corpses of new zealand businesses that tried to come over here um, and he's, he's absolutely right. Uh, but I do think that is because they came over as New Zealand businesses. If you, if you put your feet on the ground and you go, I'm in Australia, I'm in the Australian market, I need to get to know it and I want to be a part of it, not compete with it necessarily, but be in it and be a part of it. I just think that's, that's the, the mindset. I'm, I'm curious, like, obviously Australia and New Zealand are very closely aligned culturally, but. You, you did mention a few times there are some there are differences obviously in the language of specifics but what other what other cultural differences are there um we are quite similar i don't i don't know how many countries you'd find that are as similar as we are but i think that people are parochial and you find that between queensland new south wales victoria right and then in christchurch in new zealand i find that particularly parochial um, that's again a market, right? We're doing well in now because we have someone on the ground who went to school there, who knows the people, and you know Elliot does a great job down there. Um, but I, I don't know if there's it's actually a similarity, and that both sides are parochial and somewhat defensive of their patch, you know, so quote unquote whatever that is. Um, but that in itself makes each each uh, territory quite unique. And um, I mean, you're down in Tassie, right? And and you you've got people in different markets. You must see the same thing. It's it's very yeah, tighten it little communities. It, it, it is. It's, it's the who you know. It's your, if, you, if they're mates of mates, then well, they must be good type, type of attitude. Yeah. It goes back to the network of um, and uh, knowing, knowing people and, and, and building that sort of credibility. Yeah. Um, and I, I do think there's a presence thing. It's yeah. not just to throw, throw your product, product out to market. People genuinely want relationships. Um, and, they do, but I think I, I think um, one 
one difference is probably what I touched on before though is that I do think New Zealand business people for whatever reason uh, maybe it's that whole number eight why mentality that, that we like to, to think of ourselves as having in New Zealand but uh, are less risk averse they will go with a new brand they will try a smaller business if they feel that the people are legitimate and the product is a good fit in Australia I just find that and again, I think this is changing a bit and I don't want to overgeneralize, but but certainly historically, I think there has been a preference to stick with the, 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 the known, the tried, the true kind of thing, um, which has made it harder for new entrants to come in and get that sort of initial purchase um, in, in the territory they're trying to nail. Did you, th- do you I, think that's true? Because we pack states a challenger, right? Yeah, like I think, um, look, I think both both of us, uh, both very innovative cultures. I think New Zealand being smaller is a lot more open to new things. But on mm-hmm. a global scale, Australia and New Zealand are way ahead of trying, giving something a go compared to like the US or the EMEA, that kind of thing. So I think in, like as you get microcosms, I do see New Zealanders are much op- more more innovative than Australia probably just because of the bigger market we've got that there's more impacts to just diving in and give something a go compared to um, New Zealand because you have to mm. um, be more innovative. And I think that's what drives the same difference from us to like EMEA to, to, to North America as well. I wonder if that's a, a byproduct also of just the size of the economy. A lot of New Zealand businesses, even our big businesses for New Zealand are actually quite small. You know, the, the definition of enterprise has to be different between the two countries because we just don't have enough of those big ones. The bigger the company, the more bureaucratic, the more boxes need to be ticked. That that doesn't necessarily, it does slow things down a bit, but it probably also puts a different lens on a, and a more risk averse lens on a decision to choose a vendor. I think so. I did a um, little thing the other week around the, biz- the, the numbers of businesses um, between Australia and New Zealand and I think there's only like I can't remember off my top of my head, but there's only like two two thousand eight hundred businesses in New Zealand that were above a hundred people. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, so, but, okay. I, I feel I feel my points validated, which is good. I, I think. Um, oh, actually, so just slight change of subject. Just um, I, I wrote down a couple of things here that actually go back to your point. What challenges do you have to overcome? Uh, two more. One travel budget because holy crap, you do a lot of travel. The amount of times when I was running. And I still, oh, we've, we've got big enough now that I've got some great people doing a lot of the running around over in New Zealand for, for us. But um, I, for the last probably 17 years, I've been in New Zealand one month, uh, one week out of each month on average, right? And that, that adds up. So you've got to have a travel budget. And the second one is time of day coverage. When you're trying to cover everything from WA through to Bloomin and Bicargill, albeit New Zealand's got the one time zone, so don't know why I said that. Uh, you really have to think about your scheduling, where people are based, time of day coverage. So that is that is something that gets harder. You you have to um, satisfy the customer service expectations of more people in more places. So, uh, yeah, that's that's from time to time been a, a tricky proposition. It's a big investment, isn't it? Like it's a this it's high risk, high reward. Um, I guess if you don't if you don't get it right, because you, like like you said, well, all of a sudden you're extending the support hours. That can be that could help you get a lot more deals like you, you highlighted before of, or you get, you've got some clients in New Zealand signed up because there's Australian presence it allows you to provide more coverage, all of that kind of stuff. And mm. that's probably intangible. You said it's a bit of that intangible data that you can't quite, quite represent just from a P P and L. Yeah. Um, but also it's like you throw more people at it. It costs a lot more. Um, it's a bit of a chicken and the egg thing, and that's probably the difficulty for smaller businesses to think about extending yeah. over the ditch either way. I think people can smell bullshit too, right? If you say, I'm in Australia as a New Zealand business and you have a PO box somewhere out on your website, people are like, yeah, sure, buddy. Yeah, you know, a 1300 number in a, in a PO box does not an Australian business make. So you really do need to invest in the people, the offices, the, the capabilities, the all of that, right? Um, and one thing we said from the outset was we're going to ensure that we have uniform capabilities across both sides of the Tasman. So if we have a person from Australia or New Zealand come to us saying, can you do UC? Can you do, you know, um, trans-Tasman uh, protected uh, fiber? Can you do, you know, um, intermetro uh, protected backhaul? The answer is yes. So we just, we didn't want to have to have awkward sales conversations based on location. So you're right. It's, a, it's an investment if you want to do it well. Um, 
I also think though there's an opportunity to be smart about it, which I definitely, definitely didn't think about early enough. I, I, I kind of hate myself for this because it's so kind of obvious in retrospect, but don't come to a market and go the smartest players to compete head on with everyone who's already doing this particular thing. Think about as a company coming in from a different place, what can you offer in that market that isn't currently offered there? And easy to say, harder to do. I guess I'll give an example where um, as a telco in the Australian market would be stupid to go, hey, you know what we can do? Beat all the Australian telcos in Australia where they've had a 10 year head start. They've got DCs in every place. Amazing, you know, tier one NBN poise, 121 NBN poise. Like we're not going to beat that. So what can we be? The New Zealand supplier of choice for Australian telcos. Build them an AUD if they want it, NZD if they want it, you know, be super flexible with how we do it. Have people on the ground who can meet with their people who understand the market, provide really quality content that talks them through exactly what the New Zealand market is like, what each acronym means, you know, what is the TC4 equivalent, the NBN EE equivalent. You can own that, right? And, and I don't think there's a lot of other in New Zealand businesses doing that well at least that I've seen, and I'm definitely biased, so take that with a grain of salt. But, you know, the, that that's an example of where you can come into a new market, succeed, and again, wish I'd done it earlier, but it's paying off now, and 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 work with the market rather than against it and and not be seen as someone that everyone needs to kind of fob off. So, um, yeah, that's, that's a key learning. Uh, I think that's a very, very important one because, yeah, I suppose as you expand not just the expansion you're having to take in scale into account as well as like what actually is your your usp in this and mm. what what value you're providing because you might have that smaller market and you've taken that's how we have built from but maybe that's not what's going to take you to the next the next level of business growth either yeah and i think when you when you do have that sort of usp you can create far more compelling content and i think you know content marketing um, and growth marketing in general, which I think relies on that sort of demand gen content play. It's so much easier to stand out from the crowd when your content focuses on a niche. And, and you know, again, you're not trying to be everything to everyone in what is already a fairly saturated market. So, um, and, and, you know, even AdWords, right? What, what, ad, what, what search terms are you looking to capture? Gets way easier. Uh, lower cost. You're not, you're not fighting for NBN as a search term, you know. Uh, you're looking for NZ wholesale or something uh, or AU wholesale for NZ uh, searches or whatever. So, yeah, th there's definitely some um, some advantages to doing that and it's it's far more cost effective for businesses on a limited budget. Um, I would say, though, that we've already done that, so probably any other talk you're listening, don't worry about it. Now it's done. So, yeah, all good. Yeah, tick. No, yeah. no competition. <laughs> yeah. That's well, it, uh, yeah. Pro monopolies, so like why? We're, we're super pro monopoly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So if you were to... Um, you know, if you were to open up another branch trying to get into a in, into a market like you, you know, starting in australia again mm. you've spoken about that boots on the ground the parochial type stuff mm. what, what sort of people would you start off having in in that presence um i i guess i i think you've got to have two really i don't know which one i'd pick first really but i think you've got to have someone who can meet in a pre-sales technical capacity to talk with some confidence around, um, you know, customers' requirements, the problem they're trying to solve and how this, this actually scope it, is this fit for purpose? And, and that just builds so much trust. Like again, we're, we're a channel focused entity. So, so the people we're talking to are smart. They, they know bullshit. They already know quite a lot about the products. What they're looking for is just that step up. Okay, I know the feature set, but my customer's requirements are X. In this case, will that particular feature cut the mustard? And you need someone who can have that conversation in person. And then the second one is someone who is likable, uh, a good salesperson. They don't have to be technically brilliant, but they have to do what they say they'll do when they say they'll do it. Uh, be reliable and likable. And, and they are the people who ultimately will go and make sure the relationships are sound because people buy from people. Um, and also that that pre-sales technical person ideally shouldn't be a dickhead either. Obviously, no one should be. Uh, it's important that when you're a company with very few people, the people you have need to be likable and they need to be invested and they need to be motivated. And how you do that as a business is, is obviously up to you, but there's a whole range of ways to do that through incentives of various kinds. Yeah, you know, I think we're you, you know, that sort of what you're talking about with like someone that building the network, the more sales relationship side, and that sort of technical, that technical person. From my experience, I think you need, I think you need to invest in both to start. Like I don't, yeah, I, I think you're 100 percent right. Like you could start with the, the sales person, and 
build all this network and there's no one to back them up. Yeah. Or you've got to be very clever in the way that you back them up. Um, on the flip side, if you've got that more technical person, they're not going to build the network. So you're relying on a lot of people to come, come to them. Um, and without that, um, marketing and the, the sales, uh, a clever sales approach, you, you'll probably get limited amount of people coming to you. And I think that's, yeah. that's probably the uh, mistake I see a lot with, um, businesses expanding into new regions they lead with one or the other and not realize actually it's both yeah and i think um i think uh, i understand why businesses do it in that they might have a a a likable sales type going out and trying to leverage the resources they already have in another jurisdiction but but they really you you can't really go past even though i know we do a lot on on, and it sounds like a pre-covid approach but i know we do a lot on teams and zoom etc but i still think in person first meeting second meeting whatever after a scope and call go see them in person create that that sense of buy-in that sense of trust particularly again where it's a recurring business model pax it's the same right you guys are in there for the long term with your clients you need to have that that establishing and retaining um a a relationship off a solid base we're the same if you're doing transactional sales okay different probably and and i'd be open to to push back on that but but certainly for relationship based selling that there is that need to go look we're not sort of phoning in support as we need it from some other place you're never going to meet this person i just think there's the need to 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 be there in person yeah i am like we're we're using pack shade as an example because obviously we're we're large and we're hitting the whole region wait we are investing in having local presence around the different states and major cities um, yeah. because of that. Like it's that you need some form of relationship. And I think you probably don't need to worry about having too much expertise locally. Um, like use me as an example. I always, I can always be flown in if it's that important mm. to, to go see a partner. Um, and I think that's the, there's that sort of balanced approach of finding what, what's the base level of presence you need and then and then work out how do you manage the 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 other um communication and interactions in the business and like you touched on earlier travel budgets are super important and they're not small i actually think the other thing i didn't touch on is just culturally within your own business um when i joined lightwire it was a business of roughly 20 people all in one office in hamilton since i joined lightwire we now have people across two countries in about eight cities and trying to keep a sense of cultural alignment people actually knowing who the hell they work with and a company where we deeply care about that that's that's been difficult as well not difficult to the point that we haven't overcome it but for example at head office when when i started we had a um a gym on site and a full-time pt um that that people got to use during uh, during business hours you know andrew as a business owner has always been very um focused on on um culture and, and well-being so he's done a lot of quite progressive things so then people when i started in australia it was like okay we'll pay for your gym remotely you know and we'll introduce a well-being allowance and stuff that's all great that aligns people makes no one feel like they're missing out because of where they're based that's kind of a big tick but the next one is um you know do people actually ever see each other do they know who they're working with I, i've worked with people for a long time and, and i've liked them that's fine but when i met them in person for the first time over a coffee over a beer whatever i felt like i actually connected and, and I think that's super important. And we try and get everybody together twice a year, June, Christmas. We have light wire days when we get everyone there, where we have a couple of days with a particular focus. Last time it was the uh, the five dysfunctions, going through what they mean, how we avoid them, doing sessions with, uh, I think it was about 15 to 20 people at a time, um, led by Scott, our chief operating officer and I. Uh, and, and you know, that, that, that's super important. And, and it is a challenge and it does take constant focus and it does cost money because you gotta fly people around and put them up and all that kind of stuff. but made it so you, you can't get around it yeah and that too having mul- multiple people everywhere goes back to the time zone challenge too you've yes. only got limited time where most of your team cross over to interact with each other or virtually um so you've got to be very deliberate about um holding formal meetings and things like that and and not um not going into that sort of time creep of people working long hours to cover cover the time zones because that's the only time you can talk to each other that's a good point too i actually work um i've always worked somewhere between 6 30 and 7 starts and i finish you know three or three thirty um to make sure that i'm keeping in touch as best i can with people on both sides but yeah we've definitely got um 
Yeah. Daylight saving sucks, basically. It's so confusing. <laughs> uh, every every meeting we've got. So, yeah, it, that, that is a challenge. And we, I don't even think we've nailed that, you know, because you're, you're constantly adjusting or balancing between customer requirements, team communication requirements, the fact that people in roles like mine, like um, our head of uh, service and provisioning over here, um, uh, uh, one of our network architects based over here, over here, obviously being Southeast Queensland, uh, yeah. you know, they have a responsibility for clients on both sides. There are BDMs in the South Island that will be like, hey, I need this network architect to be on a call at this time. Well, okay, that turns out that's 7 a.m. Brisbane time. So you're right, that's that's a challenge and, and honestly, a, you know, it's a, it's a work in progress, to be honest. Yeah. I've been doing it for a long time in my role and it's every year daylight savings hits and uh, it's yeah. just if queensland could just get it together and stop worrying about the curtains fading or the cows going off their milk or whatever the issue is or just everyone stop doing it i don't care which just pick a lane and do it that'd be great i think as our economies evolve we're, we're probably going to have to get a lot more aligned um mm. you know, between especially between australia and new zealand at least let alone southeast asia because yeah it's not just time zones with daylight savings it's also public holidays right like mm, each state has just their had... own different public holidays new zealand australia have different public holidays. we just had king's birthday yesterday we we're recording yep. what, what's the date tuesday the something uh the seventh is that the seventh day six seventh six there you go that's close yep. so yesterday was the king's birthday in uh, new zealand right and uh, not here yep. uh in in, in, new, in australia so yeah, we had pretty much most of the company off. Um, and, and that's another thing too. If the if there was genuine like domestic equivalent travel between the two countries, that would make a lot of people's lives easier. It would be so much more efficient for so many people in so many businesses. So I think that genuinely is something that needs to be looked at. So you've been doing you've been doing this and you, like you said, uh, you know, probably in the past six to 12 months, you've been, uh, been a lot more confident and probably starting to reap re rewards like what now you're on the other side of a lot of challenges there's always going to be challenges mm -hmm. what what do you see how do you see that you you're going to grow and leverage that um the the fact that you're across tasman um what we're finding is that we have fairly large Australian clients now that um, you know don't have the scale to go full into fully into New Zealand. So they're looking for a partner. We, we've got a lot of that, and vice versa, um, being the Australian partner, Australian supplier of choice for New Zealand entities, and that that's obviously a nice natural fit. Um, we we've, we've actually got better uh, in recent times in just simplifying our messaging too, which is really making it easier for people to find us and understand what we actually think we do well. So yeah, in terms of how we're going to leverage it and what we're going to do, uh, I see us being very busy. We're having uh, most days now, I've got several inbound leads. Um, a lot of it coming from Australia to be fair, which is fantastic. Um, I think we're going to, to see um, people looking to do things as efficiently as possible in a tough economic environment. And our job is to uh, explain to people why operating on both sides of the Tasman with our assistance is the smartest thing to do or is a smart thing to do and how we can make it um, as profitable and low risk as possible. So yeah, that, that, that's the, the, the focus over the next six to 12 months. And obviously, you know, keeping, uh, keeping parity around the, um, around the product space, there's, there's still a lot happening. Everyone, particularly in the UC space is, is moving pretty quickly. So got to make sure we don't rest on our laurels there. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's a, t it's a tough, it's a tough one at the moment because everyone keeps talking about this looming recession, but I don't see any sign of it um, in terms of purchasing patterns from from clients. Um, and I see a lot of people signing a lot of uh, you know new terms and new services. And I don't know. Did that answer your question? Was that the question you're asking? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, good. Is. Good. Good. I just started talking then and sort of kind of forgot what I was talking about. So sorry. Cool. You're used to asking the questions, aren't you? It's... <laughs> yeah, I'm out of my comfort zone. This is not my space. Uh, but you're right. It's, it's. I actually think, I don't know. I think it's easier. It's weird. You said at the outset, it's easier being the guest. I think it's easier being the host because as long as you've re done enough research to ask the questions and set them free, but being a guest, you feel less like you've got to say something smart, weirdly, because you're assumed to know what you're talking about because you've been asked the question. I don't know. It's a weird It's a weird space. I'm still still figuring it out. Oh. We we could talk a lot about this, and this is very much a subject that I'm very keen on because I can see not just um, Australia, Australian and New Zealand companies going each way over the ditch. I do think both Australia and New Zealand need to look a lot more into Southeast Asia. 
Mm. Oh, man. Singapore yeah. is a really interesting market. Uh, oh. Singapore, Thailand, Indonesia, Philippines, Malaysia, they're all massive markets. They're all bigger than Australia and New Zealand combined, except for Singapore. Mm. Well, their GDP is obviously a lot larger, but um, in terms of population sizes, we've so we've got a lot of opportunity. And like you said, we do a lot of innovation. So I want to see, I want to sort of build this um, thought process up and I, uh, this ecosystem across Pax 8 to get our businesses bigger across the region. Mm. But if you were to, you know, looking back in your crystal ball and knowing what you know now, if you were to start up in a, in a new region, how much, how much would you be budgeting to invest in, in, into doing, into doing it properly? Like forgetting money is an issue. And you just said, I had X amount of money to start realistically what would that what would you think you'd need to do that uh, you mean you'd be looking at better part easy you know 300k for salaries year one you, you'd need to presuming you're in a telco type environment the infrastructure right you've got to actually have some dcs that easily be smashing 10k a month and rack fees cross connects transit then you got to get your certification presumably or your your um your msa is in place with your um, vendors over there so whichever market it is so I hate to think, I mean, if you do that with MBN here, you, that's, that's several hundred thousand and probably six to nine months. And that's probably just to get your first boy um, live. So, yeah, I mean, uh, you'd, you'd burn through, you'd burn through a mill, you'd think in your first year or so. I don't know. I'd, it'd be significant. And again, it's going to vary by market, by, by industry segment, um, by your ability to, to relocate existing people to a new market while they continue to fulfill functions in the market they just came from, you know, because you can move people around. We've actually done that quite a lot um, in Australia. I think um, we've got one, two, three, three, or I feel like I'm missing out someone, at least three people um, who now live in Australia that were with us in New Zealand. Oh, that we have a fourth plant. That's right. So, so, so very much that, that helps a lot if you, if you want to decrease costs, but yeah, look, it's, it's, it's absolutely a, a burning pit of money uh year one the the thing is well okay that's fine it, no one minds spending money as long as there's a return and so how quickly can you can can convince yourself that that, that return is going to come there and and again i just go back to uh ingrain yourself in the market um legitimize your brand as best you can don't take on the market head on find a niche um and and then you know create content that 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 establishes you as an expert within that niche and makes it easy for people to find you and, and educates them on the problem that you uniquely can can solve and they may not have even realized they had yet i'll give you one example so the other day i um i met with a guy i won't, won't drop names because you you know him but but just because just in case you just want me to say um but you know he he said to me look we we've had so many opportunities in new zealand and i just didn't even know where to start and he's like, so now this makes that easy, right? And, and, and this is a company with like 100 plus people, 100 plus staff, well-established, you, you know, quality operator. But it's just, it, when you have opportunities incrementally coming to you, oh, here's a New Zealand opportunity. Yeah, not too hard. Don't worry about that. Then there's another one. Oh, yeah, too hard. Don't worry about that. But if you actually take them bit by bit, it's a huge, it's a huge opportunity you're missing. But people, again, don't know where to start. You can, by going and having lunch and dinner with people and not trying to compete with them head on, but saying, what problem can I help you solve? Here's something we do that others don't man if i had my time again that would have been my focus day one just just that i had some golden advice and you know, the the budgeting thing just uh, brought that up to spark some thoughts from people of yeah, it probably is going to co cost you a couple of million so there's two ways to go about it is bootstrap it and, and work it out the other thing is acquisition it seems mm. to be something that we don't think about well Maybe if I'm an MSP in the strat, maybe I just acquire a New Zealand MSP and I've already got local presence. And obviously that comes with its own challenges, but that's a different way to, to go to market. Very, very legitimate. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I do think if you ask about trends earlier on, uh, one I didn't get to is I do think we're going to start to see uh, NZ uh MSPs and telcos, and we're probably already seeing the MSP space, to be fair, the telco space less so. But certainly in the telco space, I think we're going to start to see Australian um, telcos buying up New Zealand ones and New Zealand telcos buying up small to medium size um, Australian ones as well, because you're right, that's a, way, a good way to get existing revenue, um, solve a problem, go forward. But I do think the multiples at the moment are still relatively high. So, yeah. Well, 
wrap, wrapping it up, what if if you could leave everyone with you, a final thought? What's the what's the thing you'd most want people to take away from this conversation today? What would that be? Hmm. Uh, what works in one place probably won't work in the other. No one cares about what you do in the other country. In our case, no one in Australia cared about what we did in New Zealand. They care about what you can do here. So uh, go talk to people, understand the market, listen, learn, don't come in all guns blazing thinking that you know what is going to work and what you're best to do. Set time aside to, to listen and educate yourself. That would be... And also, by the way, uh, probably don't be as young as I was when I first started doing it because I definitely thought I had all the answers or just didn't want to admit that I didn't have all the answers. So being older and, and so at least a little bit wiser is also a good thing. Oh, that is that's some sage advice and i re really appreciate you uh jumping on brendan and no doubt we'll have another conversation in the future and learn from more lessons that you've you've had in the in the future mate, i'll have to get you back on our podcast next it's my turn but uh no it's been fun mate thank you for having me on thanks very much